We're back with a bonus conversation you'll only see here on CBS News New York. So, Jamal Bowman, you made a resolution, you, you offered a resolution to have him expelled. And, and I stand by it. It's very pointed. There's 140 people in a D.C. jail today, as we speak, rotting for obstructing congressional uh, hearings and proceedings. Jamal Bowman did no different. I was there that day. I mapped out the timeline. It's all in my uh, former official Twitter. You can have a look there and you'll see how he lied to the D.C. DA about his whereabouts after he pulled the alarm. So you think that the fact that they censored him and not expelled him was wrong? It's a slap in the wrist. It's a slap in the face of society where he admitted to something, pled guilty, was given a slap in the wrist while there's people who are facing 20 years in jail for doing absolutely the same thing. Why did he get a free pass? Because he's an elected Democrat. That's why, Marsha. I mean, I hate to be pointed and I hate to be so partisan, but that's the only thing I can point to because the same DA that is prosecuting all these people for January 6th, could not bring herself to do exactly what she should have done, which was to call it uh, an obstruction of a congressional hearing, because he did. He delayed the vote by over an hour, giving time for the Democrats to go read a bill that they didn't know how to vote on. And this was midst a, a government shutdown. So it is what it is. Look, you got to call the shots out for what they are. This isn't personal to Jamal, but he knew he knew that pulling an alarm didn't open doors. He was a school principal. So I have a question for you. You've been through an awful lot. Do you have a support network that helps you get through this? I do. I have a great husband. I have a great family. I have great friends. And I got to tell you, I couldn't have done it without my staff. I love those people, each and every one of them. They were there to the bitter end. Even some who jumped out earlier because they got a little flabbergasted, I still love them because the support they gave me throughout this year, I couldn't have done it without them. I, I truly mean it. So... Uh, this must have been really difficult for your family. It was tough. I mean, they put up bail for you. It was tough. They believed in you, but it must have been really hard for them to go through this with you. It was very tough. It wasn't easy, and I thanked them every day for it. I mean, it, without family, your we're nothing. Your sister, your father. Everybody, my sister, my dad, my niece, even my poor niece, my five-year-old autistic niece has gone through the ringer with this, with school. I mean. It's it's tough, but look, we're getting back there. I'll tell you one thing. The moment I was expelled, that all went away. So are you going to write a book? Yes. What are you going to call it? I'm thinking about that title yet, but I will definitely be writing a book. I'm actually going to be having a couple of meetings this week about that subject. People are asking you to write books? Yes. So uh, what else is your, your, how else are you going to raise money? I mean, you're going to have some big legal bills. Uh, look, right now I'm doing the cameo thing, and I have a few other prospects for employment that I'm looking at. Um, haven't right. really made a decision. Uh, believe it or not, in policy and advocacy, people really like my record. I had a 100% voting record score with Heritage Foundation. So they want you to be a lobbyist? Or not what? a lobbyist, more of a policy advocate, uh, you know, so, so a spokesperson kind of say. And I'm willing to do that, Marsha. So... Saturday Night Live has been parodying you. I wonder how you feel about it, and we're going to let our viewers see some of the things they've said about you. Sure. You want me to say that I lost, that I'm humiliated? Fine. So I'm no longer Congressman Santos. I'm just regular old Professor Major General <laughs> Reverend Astronaut Santos, <laughs> Protector of the Realm, <laughs> Princess of Genovia. <laughs> How do you feel? Give that man that? an Emmy. <laughs> How do you feel when you hear somebody look, make fun of you? Look, I, I take it in strides. If they're making fun of you, you're doing something right. It's, it's, it's actually flattering uh, in a way. Most politicians get really offended when they make fun of, fun of their looks. Why or, don't you? I just, I have good humor. I, I was the king of self-deprecating jokes my entire life. I'd make fun of myself like, oh great, I'm a minority glutton. I'm fat, I'm Hispanic, <laughs> and I'm gay. Like, like, I always joke like that. So you like the, spot the spotlight? Uh, it's not the spotlight. It's it's really just I don't mind the 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 jokes and the humor. Look, I mean, Joan Rivers was one of my favorite people on earth. And I mean, how many times was that woman roasted? And I think I probably draw a lot of inspiration from that kind of grit that she had. And I'm like, I mean, if she can do it, I can do it, too. <laughs> so you've rejected officers of a offer of a documentary. Why? I've rejected a couple of offers of documentary. Why? Because um, that's going to be done in my time. 
not when these people want it. You know, HBO wants to go write a movie about a fictitious book without any involvement from me, my family, or anybody within my orbit. Go ahead. It's you know, it's fine. I'll I'll do one when it's when it's ready. There's going to be a movie about you anyway. There will. Who's going to play you? I don't know. It'll make their career, though. <laughs> Who do you want to play you? I don't know. I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I've never thought of a movie being made about me, so I wouldn't even know where to start, truly. Will you ask for a piece of the profits? Uh, if a movie is made about me and I'm contributing, absolutely, Marsha. <laughs> How long do you think your fame will be? Will, will last? Will it be I, long, short-lived? I, look, it's not about fame. It's if I can stay relevant so I can keep advocating for the things I believe in and, and I can be impactful in the 2024 presidential race, it could be short-lived all the way until November of 2024 and I will be a very happy person. So what's the strangest thing you ever found, you saw in Washington about life in Washington? The strangest thing in Washington I witnessed was uh, people cheating on their spouses. What? Yeah. No. No. Well, in the matter I saw, it was very strange to me. When two married people are, are cheating on their, both their spouses when they're back home as they're supposed to be serving in Congress, that, that felt gross. Members of Congress, staffers, who? Members of Congress cheating on their spouses with one another. Really? Yeah, that's how bad it is in D.C. Well... So let's look. And that's going to get me a lot of heat. <laughs> I think that will, but I'm not asking. I'm not names dropping names. names. <laughs> so um, the special election, there's going to be a special election to replace you. So far, we know that Tom Suozzi is going to be the Democratic nominee and the Republicans are still trying because of what you did. They're still trying to vet all the people who want to have that, um, who want to run. So look at the opportunities the Republican Party has to nominate a bunch of Republicans are in the mix, 22. I know a lot of them, good conservatives. But right now their top two contenders is a registered Democrat, which I like her, don't get me wrong, but I think it's a little slap in the face that she's been elected as a Republican now since 2021, and that's Mozzie Phillip, and she hasn't changed her registration. She should change her registration if she's going to run for Congress. And what about Mike? Mike Saprocone donated $39,000, almost $40,000, to Tom Swazi's primary gubernatorial race just last year. So. The way I look at it, no matter which way you slice it, there's going to be a Democrat replacing me in Washington, D.C., for sure. So you endorsed Mike Zappercohn. He didn't want your endorsement. Oh, I ironically did it because I think he's corrupt. Oh, so you didn't really oh, mean it. Oh, no, no, I did it. Then I, I followed up that tweet. No, he's, he's corrupt. He's a cop who, who cost the city of New York $3 million in malfeasance lawsuit practices because he was a bad cop. Well, I think he's been disputing that, but let's ask, let's, ask, let's ask this question. So the district that Tom Swazi originally represented before you replaced him is different than the district that oh, it's you... It's very different. It's a lot more Republican. Yes, it is. So how do you... Can a Republican win? Can a Democrat win? A Republican can win if they don't run a cookie-cutter campaign, if they do what I did, go to the communities, meet the people. Go out there, be a part of the community. Don't just do the photo op handshakes and di dine and dash as they all like to do. I didn't do that. I was, if I would go to a, an event, I'd be the first one there and last one out. I'd shake every hand and people would say, oh, you're never gonna get enough events. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I will do as many as I humanly can and meet every single person there. So here's the question. So do you think that if it's redistricted, that the Democrats will try to redraw your district to put, go back to the old district, take away some of the Republican areas that were put in the district, and then make it easier for a Democrat to win that seat. Look, the reality is Long Island is becoming really challenging for Democrats as the policies of Republicans benefit Long Islanders more. Um, even with corruption, they, they do have a better outcome when Republicans are running the, the, the show out there. So it's going to be very difficult for uh, Democrats to redraw those seats. I think Long Island has now become a absolute three seat Republican, one Democrat. So if they really play around with the pencil, they'll get a Democrat in there. But it's, it's going to be a lot of hard work to do that. Are you worried that they're going to try to redistrict 
and make it much diff more difficult for all the Republicans in Long Island to win? I think it's difficult to do that, like I said, but uh, never, never underestimate a district that starts in Nisiquag and ends in Mamaroneck. They tried <laughs> that already. <laughs> so never that was district. <laughs> yeah, never under, I, I registered to run in that district. I was going to get a boat to go to Westchester and back. So never underestimate that. So people have talked about a lot of other things that you could do. A podcast, Dancing with the Stars. Would you do any of that? I don't know. Look, I, I have four left feet, so I don't know about Dancing with the Stars. Only if you go with me, Marsha. <laughs> I have five left feet now. So how about a new George Santos reality show, Truth or Dare? Uh, that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I haven't explored any of that. There's a lot of requests for all sorts of reality TV and documentaries and docuseries and movies. Um, it's just not what's priority to me right now. I have other priorities, as you can imagine. And and we'll talk about that at a later date, for sure. So when you, so, you sort through these offers is there anything that appeals to you and have you talked it over with your husband about what you should be doing in the future yeah no there's things that appeal to us for sure and uh we were definitely going to be going over this but the one thing that we're most interested in is a real docu-series with real facts and no fiction that's that's really what i think is important is to remove any element of fictional uh uh, uh flair to a docu-series that's where i would definitely be leaning so there are going to be people who are going to say, how can you remove fiction when your, your whole resume was fiction? Well, that's my point. You keep all of it there and you just tell the story as it happened. And I think that's what's going to really interest the American people. Are you going to express regrets about how it went down? Absolutely. I, I express regrets now constantly. There's so many things I would have done different if I had an opportunity, especially people I would have gotten involved with. So last question. If you could look into the camera and talk to your constituents, after all that's happened, what would you say to them? I would say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it ended like this. And I hope that you can see what I accomplished as far as what I promised you during the campaign that I would do and that you feel like there was a sense of delivery there. And I hope to see you all out in the district as we're out there dining and having fun. And, and I'm sorry, and I will terribly miss being able to have the awesome responsibility to serve you in the House of Representatives. Will they forgive you? I hope so. I believe so. Because I've, I've seen uh, a trend of people reaching out again and people coming back around and slowly but surely. So look, I'll do my best, Marsha. I, I miss a lot of people that have stopped speaking to, speaking to me. And those are the people that I really want to try to reconnect with. And I'm going to work hard on that. Biggest regret? Biggest regret was um, not taking advice from somebody that gave me somewhat of an idea that I was kind of around the wrong people. I just brushed it off as, you know, uh, political uh, discord. And it wasn't. It was deeper than that. Is there a time period, like it takes five years, 10 years? How are you going to? I think it takes at least five years to, to get back on your feet after something like this. Well, I wish you good luck. And without, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. And thank you at home for joining us as well.